Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration. I'm Lance Harris, Sites Director for the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, overseeing the Grand Village of the Natchez Indians and Historic Jefferson College. I'm honored to introduce Dr. Tammy Greer as she presents Yachni Achukma, Okla Achukma, Healthy Land, Healthy People. Dr. Tammy Greer is a member of the United Hall Mission and an Associate Professor of Psychology, specializing in quantitative psychology, and Director of the Center for American Indian Research and Studies at the University of Southern Mississippi. She has collaborated on numerous endeavors with tribal nations and members that have led to the formation of the center, the building of the 1,000 square foot Medicine Wheel Garden on the Southern Miss campus, while also providing workshops and talks on Southeastern American Indians. She is currently funded by Mississippi Idea Network of Biomedical Research Excellence and works in conjunction with the Telenutrition Center at Southern Miss to address health disparities in Southeastern Indian country. Before I hand it over, please note that we will monitor the comments section throughout our time for any questions that will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Now, sit back and enjoy, and please welcome my friend, Dr. Tammy Greer. Thank you, Lance. I'm gonna try to share screen. I think I can do it. Thank you so much for having me. And I want to start by acknowledging the original inhabitants of the land upon which the Hattiesburg and Gulf Park Southern Miss campuses are built. I want to honor the unnamed ancestors who were the first to walk the Pine Hills and Gulf Coastal Plain and those whose origin and migration stories, medicine and plant knowledge are of this place. I offer my respect to the living descendants of those people and to those who still occupy this territory as a sovereign nation, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. <coughs> and I want to tell you a story. In 2005, Joe Bohannon, was a, he's right there on the right, was a graduate student at Southern Miss. He was from Oklahoma and a member of the Choctaw Nation. And those Oklahoma relatives, they powwow and so he started a yearly powwow at Southern Miss. He also formed a native focused student group and they named themselves the Golden Eagles in a tribal society. And that is Joe dressed out as a straight dancer for a powwow and that's my little straight dancer, Kalik. One day I got a call from Joe asking whether I wanted to be a co-faculty advisor to the student group. He said, being a faculty advisor is a lot of work and he needed help. But I think he realized that he was graduating. He was going to move on. He didn't say anything about that and leave me with the whole shebang. But I said, sure, I'll help out. And so he asked what I wanted to bring to the group. Like I had been thinking about that. I was just like, okay, I'll help out. Because I hadn't been thinking about that at all. But I did recall to him that I had heard a conversation or actually several conversations by elders about how we are forgetting our plant names, about who these plants are, what they're about, about our understandings of their medicines. And I told Joe, I eventually became Dr. Bohannon, that we needed a permanent place on campus for native folks to come so that we could realize that this place, the Southern Miss campus, was friendly to us natives. And I powwowed when I was a kid, so I love powwows too, but powwows come, powwows go, and I thought we need something year round. And he asked what that might be, and I said, well, maybe a native plant garden, a garden filled with plants that our ancestors used for housing, food, drink, dyes, tools, clothing, weapons, basket materials, and on and on like that, so that our elders could come with the youth and pass their knowledge of these plants on to our youth. And Joe found a book called Medicine Will Gardens, and we both really loved that idea for the shape of the garden. So we set about looking for garden funding. I found SIVA, which is a grassroots organization, and I wrote for a garden. When we got funded, 
just a couple of thousand dollars, we needed a campus space. And I was sure that we could get some kind of space because we have space like out in the woods and research park and all. But I thought they would give us some really small space somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. But I thought better than nothing, it's a start. But I also actually knew the CFO at the time, Greg Lassen, and that's him with my little girl, Kyla. And so I asked him for a garden space. Within a few days, he took me around campus and he was pointing out places and much to my surprise, he offered up this space that you see right here. This space is kind of central on campus. It's behind the international building, behind the dance building, behind the liberal arts building, and it's near a parking lot. It's also near a campus food place. So it's really central and it's easy to access and it was way better than I hoped for. The catch was that the already overworked physical plant folks would not have to have anything to do with the garden. What they did not know at the time was that I was no kind of gardener. I did not know anything about native plants. The proposition was totally overwhelming to me, but in our native communities, we're often asked to do things that are totally outside of our lanes. And that's because there's just a few of us. There's only, we're only 2% of the US population. Our tribes are small. We don't have a lot of people. A lot of the people we do have are kids or people who are working all the time. And so all of us kind of have to wear numerous hats and learn on the job. So even though we felt inadequate for the task, we agree, we agree that we should tend, we would build and we would tend this garden. Siva gave us enough money to buy topsoil and rocks to form. I'm going to go back for one second. There we go. Siva gave us enough money to buy topsoil and rocks to form the outline of the wheel. So in the summer of 2005, faculty from biology and psychology and social work and English and tribal members from the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, they all came and we created a medicine wheel outlined with rocks and we put down topsoil to ready the space for plants. I put out an all call and folks like would go home to Arkansas and bring me more rocks from their rivers up there because we ran out of money and we still needed to fill the path, paths with rocks. I knew that people bought plants from Walmart and Lowe's and Home Depot, so I went looking for native plants there first. They don't have any native plants there. Turns out that most natives are thought of as weeds, like Yopan holly is thought of as a trash plant by lots of folks. Although you can buy yopan holly bushes in stores, but most folks want to get rid of the plants that I was looking to put in our garden. And I had no idea how to get the plants I wanted in there, plants that our ancestors used for housing, food, drink, dyes, like that. We let folks adopt areas just to fill the space so that we could save the space for native plants when we ever figured out how to get them in there. And I never forgot the intention that we wanted a native plant garden. And so when I went to recruitment events like uh, the Choctaw Indian Fair or even our events on campus for student group members, when I went to powwows, I would put up a trifle, <clears throat> like a really nice trifle that I borrowed from the dean's office and never gave back. And it had a photo of the garden in the very center of the trifle. And when people would ask, what that was, I would tell them about our medicine wheel garden and how it isn't exactly like we want because what we really want is a garden of native plants that my ancestors used for housing, food, and on and on. And sometimes, once in a while, some person or another would bring a plant, a native plant, or sometimes two or three, and I would plant those and I would think, okay, we're inching closer to the goal of a real plant native a uh, real native plant medicine will garden. And I always kept that intention and I always kept that photo front and center of what we wanted that garden to be. In 2009, I went to the Choctaw Indian Fair to recruit students and I brought 
all my brochures and I brought some little candy to give away and I brought that Dean's office trifle and I had a photo of the garden in the middle of the trifle and an elderly couple passed by my area going to the restroom and the woman came out before the man and she asked about the photo of the garden and I went through my spiel about how we're saving space for native plants and that we want plants that our ancestors used as housing and food and like that and she said that she had heard of the medicine well garden and when her husband came out she showed him the photo of the garden and they talked for a while and they asked me lots of questions and in the end before they left she said you know she thought that they could help me with the garden with the native plants and I thought awesome probably four or five more plants and we'll be four or five more plants closer to the goal and all the while we were hosting events at the garden, native events at the garden. This is Dennis Banks, who is one of the founders of the American Indian movement, who has passed since this time. He brought, I can't remember when this was, maybe 2007 or something, because we did it twice, but he brought his longest walk folks to our garden on his way walking from uh, San Francisco to Washington, D.C. In August of 2009, that couple from the Choctaw Indian Fair, Joe and Merrill Willis, called and asked if they could come down to bring some native plants to the garden. They showed up on a Friday evening with their Toyota Sequoia full of buckets of native plants, probably about 50 plants. And they were pulling a trailer behind them with another 500 native plants on that. And so over the weekend, I called everybody I knew, we planted plants and that medicine wheel became a native plant garden with plants that our ancestors used for housing, food, drink, dyes, tools, clothing, weapons, basket, basket materials and like that. Not only that, but they helped me or really did it for me. They got me in touch with Tate Trifley from DeSoto National Forest, who got us a permit to dig in the forest for native plants to populate this educational indigenous garden. And they had a permit to dig in Holly Springs National Forest for plants as well. And so we made signs for the plants with grave markers that Joe and Merrill obtained. We had access then to our own Walmart, Lowe's, and Home Depot native plant selection right there in the forest. A group from England came to Southern Miss as part of an exchange program. They worked in our garden. Pretty much everybody, if you're at Southern, you possibly might be working in my garden. My, all my statistics students work in my garden, every, my garden, our garden every semester. So when my friend Sonia Monk asked if we could have a Native American center on campus, she and Ken York from the Mississippi Band and I had a meeting with the Southern Miss administration and asked them to open a center for American Indian Research and Studies and they suggested a minor as well. So we had a program and we had a garden. And bad things happen, even in gardens. I just heard about just recently the LSU mounds being desecrated by folks who can't imagine the sacredness of that space. And I know about that. My two kids discovered this situation and reported it to me within just minutes of the vandalism. I thought, I'm, I'm not lying, I thought a tornado had touched down because it was so disorganized and so um, torn up. The garden was so torn up. But as I surveyed the area, I noticed that it was just the garden that was torn up. And it was, I didn't know what to do. It was hard to stay calm. I didn't know, you know, what I wanted to call. I did call the cops. <laughs> I tried to talk to people in the area who may have seen what had happened. It turns out that some students who were on a scavenger hunt went looking for their treasure in our garden and they made a huge mess of our sacred space. The rocks were tossed about, much of the cardboard and pine straw that was around the plants forming a weed barrier and moisture retainer for the plants was pulled out and strewn all around the garden. Plants were trampled, some were pulled up. My little girl who worked in the garden every week, pulling weeds, labeling plants. She was angry and sad. And finally she said, mom, this is gonna take forever to fix. But even as she was saying it, 
people were arriving who had the idea of what had happened and were there to fix it. The Dean of Students, Dr. Eddie Holloway showed up. His assistant was there, the president of the Student Government Association. Other members of the student government body showed up. First one, then another began asking what they could do. And we worked late into the night, relocating the rocks, replacing the cardboard and covering and replanting the plants, putting down more pine straw. And by about 10 p.m., the garden looked a lot better. The following day, the Dean of Students and the Student Government Association made donations for the garden that actually enabled us to purchase several hundred pounds of large, beautiful river rock that I had been wanting um, to finish up the garden wheel. So student volunteers then came and returned several times to help lay the rocks down. Um, Leland Lewis, who has since passed from Choctaw came and we had a blessing ceremony for the garden. The president of the Student Government Association and I together spread tobacco into the garden and the garden was even better. And I learned something that the students, they didn't really mean to harm our garden. These students went looking for their treasure and they didn't recognize that they were standing in ours. And because I thought about it, that we don't really know what may be someone else's treasure. I'm guessing that the students saw a grassy area, that's what it is, or a grassy area with some rocks or a grassy area with some rocks and plants. To many of us though, that medicine wool garden is a treasure. And there are other treasures like that that maybe lots of folks don't recognize, like the Gulf of Mexico is a treasure, not the oil in the Gulf, but the waterways that provide a livelihood, the land that provides shelter, the plants that provide healing. It's where Homa ancestors are buried and it's a treasure. And where some people might see just a pile of dirt, some pottery shards, interesting arrowheads, old bones, other people see in the very place where the first people of their kind emerged into the outer world, where they as a people were born. For some people, Nanawaya, their mother mound, it's their treasure. So I decided, or I realized that, you know, we have a lot of young minds in college and some of the lessons we teach are math and English and history and physics and art and music. And others are about how to be respectful of one another and of our differences, of our treasures. Others are about how to make right what we've wronged, about how to go beyond just reparations and make improvements. And I think when these students are in college, all of that, all of those are important lessons for them. But I've learned from my Southeastern Native American ancestors that we have to be resilient. Our ancestors really had to be resilient. They lived on the edge and we had to stay in relationship with our natural world, our provider, our mother. We did have a stewardship relationship with the earth, but it is, it always has been, and it always will be the earth who stewards us because who's the steward anyway isn't it the one who takes care of us provides for us provides for all our needs isn't it the earth who does that for us and shouldn't we as her children help her out when she needs us be respectful of her appreciate her and all that she does for us and when we get out of relationship with the earth with our own mother when we try to dominate her by creating environments that serve us without regard for how those changes affect our provider we reap the consequences of that kind of a mistake there's another paradigm though in a paradigm of co-creation the earth and all of her inhabitants the trees the plants the animals the rocks the humans they're all participants in the process of creating and changing the environment to serve all of us, all our needs, so that we all can survive and thrive on this earth. And when we make space for one another, even those who are really different from us, when we consider even the bugs, 
even the weeds, even the bugs and the weeds that will be here seven generations from now, when we consider their function, their ways, and when we make room for them, we're co-creating with the other communities on this earth. Our ancestors had to live this way. Our communities were near constantly changing streams, creeks, bayous, rivers, gulfs, and oceans. Because of this whole, because this whole southeastern area is diverse and extensive in its plants, our ancestors depended on forest foods like nuts, black walnuts, acorns, pecans, pine nuts, and hickory nuts to eat, but also to make flour and to make dye from the holes. So we wanted for our nuts to stay around. And we depended on berries like blackberries, blueberries, mulberries, strawberries, and fruits like persimmons, plums, pawpaws, and muscadines. And we used those for bread and dumplings. We depended on root crops like sweet potato, cattail, smilax, nutgrass, and medicines like purple coneflower to build our immune system, bone set to reduce fevers, prairie willow and black willow, the natural aspirin, and we created beauty in the world with our dyes like goldenrod flowers for golden yellows and pokeweed berries for pinks and black walnut hulls for browns and dock root for the most beautiful burnt orange. Our ancestors cultivated gourds, stumpweed, goosefoot, sunflower, knotweed, little barley and maygrass, and later on, corn beans and pumpkins, the three sisters because eventually they had an agriculture that sustained them all year. Our Native American Southeastern ancestors lived in houses made of mud or clay with wood post and swamp cane or palmetto roofs. We needed those plants for our homes. Their lives depended on their responses to changing seasons, vegetation, productivity, animal and seafood availability. We have evidence that our ancestors adapted these environments to increase productivity and sustainability in their communities, sometimes by burning the forests, sometimes by building mounds. My ancestors traded resources all over the U.S. with evidence of that of the caffeinated leaves of that coastal Yopan holly traded as far north as Cahokia Mound Complex in Missouri, but probably all the way up to the headwaters of the Mississippi. And they moved whole communities in response to resource depletion, changing rivers, and European encroachment. We had games like Chunky to practice skills and Stickball, the little brother of war, to solve problems. And we still play those games. And we had ceremonies. I want you to listen to this. Let me see if I can get it to play. This is stomp dancing at Moundville with Choctaw and Chickasaw folks dancing together. Stomp dancing was an important part of our green corn ceremony down here, and it still is for some tribes. During the green corn ceremony, males drank the black drink as it was called by Europeans for its dark color. The drink was based on that old Yopan holly plant, the leaves, the ones with caffeine in them. And if you mix those leaves with other plants, that concoction can induce ritualized vomiting for purification purposes. So our ancestors would bathe in the river and they would vomit so that they could be clean inside and out. And pure in that way, folks would reestablish their social relationships and the societies at large forgave all crimes except murder. After the world had figuratively and literally been made new with the relighting of the sacred fire, the villagers enjoyed a huge feast centered on the first corn and they danced. The green corn ceremony has a, uh, holds a key to being resilient 
The ceremony speaks about how to live together, how to empty yourself of real and imagined grudges, how to get along. And this getting along, this had to happen for the sake and the sustainability of the community. We lived, but we also still live in a world where community is necessary for survival. These Southeastern native plants are necessary for our survival as well, and for the survival of our traditional material cultures. And they too are resilient. They can adapt slowly over time to these environmental changes by altering their growing. Low and squat in colder climates, but tall and lean in warmer climates by forming shallow or deeper roots and by moving further north or south in subsequent generations. Our native plants can, with care, thrive along with us as our companions on this journey. They are undisputedly necessary for the survival of our Southeastern Indian material cultures. Our palmetto huts with willow frames, supple jack vine basket handles, palmetto, swamp cane, coral honeysuckle, and longleaf pine baskets, our cane and elderberry blowguns, our hickory rabbit sticks and stickball sticks. They are the jewel weed of our poison ivy treatment, the elderberry of our antivirals, and the butterfly weed of our pleurisy root. And some of them have already been used in previous pandemics to treat many of the same symptoms that we see today with COVID-19. And they still have much to teach us about being human and about how to live in community. I'm reminded of all this and often so as I tend the Southern Miss Medicine Will Garden. The wax myrtle and the swamp cane teach me how to set boundaries for my own sake and for the sake of others who need protection or who need room to grow. The wax myrtle root pounded into a warm poultice is a topical treatment for inflammation and swamp cane, well, it is used for many different things like blowguns, baskets, housing, atalals, knives, arrows, and the young shoots can be eaten. And the swamp cane lining our rivers and creeks set their own boundaries. They protect the land by preventing erosion caused by waves. I learn about respecting other, bound other people's boundaries as well. When I get too close and I'm not careful, near Spanish dagger and blackberry bushes. I've lost blood over those lessons. But then again, blackberry bushes provide nutritious food, great tasting tea and helpful medicine for colds and coughs. Spanish dagger is very useful for keeping critters large and small away from protected areas. And also the root is soap for cleansing and the dagger shaped leaves are both the needle and the thread, the cordage for binding. I have friends like those plants who on the one hand have personalities that jab and poke so that I have to be careful around them. But on the other hand, they have great qualities like fierceness and honesty and loyalty. Most all plants live in communities preferring the company of specific species. Some plants like the very medicinal and antibiotic wild ginger and also partridge berries rely on the shade of others just to survive. And they remind us that community is necessary and that our communities down here can be quite diverse. Our ancestors taught us that native plants truly are our brothers and sisters, our relatives and our friends. And we need to bring the, our whole selves into this relationship with our earth. Our rock and plant and animal brothers and sisters turns out that we are the last to be created. So we are literally the little brothers and sisters amongst all our relatives. We have to learn from them. And turns out we have lots to learn. When we ask physical plant to pave the paths to make the garden handicap accessible, they indicated that they would place one sidewalk from east to west um, straight through like I-55. But I asked if I could tell them a little bit about the garden. And I asked if we could talk about the paving of the paths. I told them that I wanted for the garden to be a destination and not a highway. 
And I explained a little bit about how life is a circle. And I told them that we wanted the garden to inform us, inspire us, teach us in every aspect of her being, including her shape, her plants, and her paths. And I don't know why they listened, probably to shut me up, but they did listen. We had students, faculty, and of course my children drawing in shapes, ancient shapes, putting leaves, pressing leaves into the concrete, calling the Choctaw kids were calling their Pokneys and asking, you know, what's the word for red? What's the word for bear? What's the word for uh, muscadine? And how do you spell it? We had someone donate concrete stain to color the directions. Joe and Merrill got that for us. And here it is. Here's our medicine wall garden. It has only one entrance coming off the sidewalk facing east. So we enter the garden on the yellow path. The yellow path is where the sun rises in the east. That's where everything comes into existence. The eastern direction is where stars, mountains, trees, civilizations, babies, new projects, manuscripts, building plans, paintings, musical scores, dance routines, scientific studies, and all relationships are born. We come into the world and our spiritual selves grow and are tended in the east. When we orient ourselves towards what is eternal, towards who we are, why we're here, how we are to behave, when we focus on and what all of the great spiritual teachings call us toward kindness, we are being respectful to that eastern direction. The eastern direction also represents the season of the year that is spring and the Asian tribes of the earth. From the east, we head south along the red path. It is in the south that we experience our youth. We're not babies anymore. In the south, we grow as young planets, trees, rocks, nations, and children. Musical scores and dance routines are practiced in the South. Papers and books are written and rewritten here. It's also in the South that we develop our emotional selves. Emotion regulation is developed here. When we need to put emotion into a project or a relationship, we do that important work in the South. When we make sure to stay healthy in our relationships and find relationships that are supportive, when we find our passion and take care of our emotional selves, we are being respectful to the southern direction. The southern direction also represents the season of the year that is summer and all of the indigenous tribes of the Americas. As we leave the southern direction, we head down the black path and to the west. It's in the west that we grow and as mature beings Musical scores, ballets, movies, operas are fully developed and performed in the West. Papers are published and laws are adopted here as well. In the West is where we develop our physical selves. When we eat healthy, stay active, take care about how we treat our bodies. When we tend to the physical aspect of others, to the earth and all of its beings, we are respecting the Western direction. And the Western direction also represents the season of the year that is fall and all of the African tribes of the earth. And when we leave the West, and we have to leave the West, we have to keep moving. We enter the white path and head North. The North is where the elders among us reside. Our own elders who may not even reach 100 years, elder tortoises, bowhead whales, and oak trees who may reach several hundred years, and bristlecone pines, who may reach several thousand years, the Cretaceous gravels of Tuscaloosian formation, who have just now reached a hundred million years, and the Methuselah star, who is 14 billion years of age, are all represented in the North. The North as well is where we grow and tend our mental selves. When we grow in knowledge and understanding, we give respect to the Northern direction. It's also in the north that we, all of us, plants, animals, rocks, mountains, planets, ideas, grow into old age and pass away. It's in the north that projects, relationships, buildings, but also bad habits, outdated ideas, destructive social systems, and useless laws end. Even when ending come, endings come, though, 
Even when your whole world has toppled, you have to take heart and stay on the wheel because even as these important and beloved members of our universe, communities, and parts of ourselves pass, new relationships, new projects, new ideas, and brand new stars are just literally around the corner being born. The northern direction also represents the season of the year that is winter and all of the Caucasian tribes of the earth. So everything is in our garden and the Southern Miss Wet Medicine Wheel garden is a mama. She gave rise to this garden, the little medicine garden in the Homa village on the Isleños Museum grounds in St. Bernard, that's in Louisiana. And there's an Istrahuma or an Itihuma red pole in the center. Our Southern Miss, Miss Medicine Wheel Garden provided seeds and plants for this baby garden. There's another Medicine Wheel Garden at Longleaf Elementary School in Hattiesburg where their fourth graders come to Native Ways school days. And you've seen some photographs of that already in this presentation. And Mama and her babies are doing just fine. And now we have a group of indigenous women working with WECAN, the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network. And we are building greenhouses all along our traditional trade routes so that we can help one another with this and other tribal folks with their indigenous gardens. This one was built in my backyard just a couple of weeks ago so that I can take all of these seeds from the mama garden and grow them out to give to people or sell or trade to support our gardens. Food sovereignty is important to tribal folks and our plants are a really important part of that. You know, um, before the Delta Blues, before we knew the term Delta even, there were Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Tunica, and Biloxi, and Natchez, and Caddo, and Pascagoula, Chittimacha, Koshada, Shakshihoma, songs sung across the Southeast. Before that blues trail, there were trade routes forged by bison that zigged and zagged across this state and joined our state with most of the rest of the entire Americas. Before fried chicken, greens, and barbecue, and apple pie, there was deer jerky, and hominy, and banaha, and fruit dumplings made from animals and plants that were natives to this area with corn and beans and pumpkins planted as the three sisters and sunflowers as the fourth sister. Before morticians and funeral homes and cemeteries, there were bone pickers, bone huts, burial mounds with our ancestors continuing to be as much a part of this world as the moon and the stars just out of reach. Before doctors, pills, and shots, there were healers, herbs, and prayers. And before there were city councils, there were tribal councils, blue-veiled women, and war chiefs, and peace chiefs who presided over those councils where issues as important as life and death were decided. You know, the people of the Southeast, the people of these tribes and others with their traditional knowledge of how to live, how to be co-creators with our mother, the earth, how to make room and be respectful for all of the beings here. They have lots to teach us and we are still here as are the ancient ones of this place still here because they're in us and with us and wherever we're gathered. And I wanna recognize them. And I wanna thank you for having us here. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, I was enthralled for your entire uh, presentation, uh, as I'm sure many others were. We actually do have some questions here, if you got a moment to uh, answer them. Uh, so one question uh, this viewer would like to know if uh, you or your organizations at Southern Mist ho host any events at the Medicine Wheel on campus. Do I have 
Wait, say it again. Uh, the question is, uh, they want to know if you or your organizations at Southern Miss host any events at the Medicine Wheel on campus. Okay, here's, we, we do. Um, we have Native Way School Day at the, at, at the Medicine Wheel on campus. Um, we have had story times at the Medicine Wheel on campus. I haven't done it lately because of COVID stuff. We also host... Um, hey, if you want to help us out, like clean up and really take out things that we don't want in there, like the non-natives, we host like days where we um, clean the garden, you know, and do the rocks and put down pine straw and things like that. Um, and other people use the space because I mean, think, it, it is a native plant garden. So the biologists, students come through there and you know, learn how to recognize those native plants and things. And the dance students sometimes do dance choreography in there. One beautiful one that I saw was, they call it the healing garden. And they danced like, came in like a sick person and left a well person from our garden. So that was pretty cool. So yes, but hey, if you have ideas about things that I could be doing that I'm not doing and you want to help me with that, come on. Well, in the vein of, uh, of helping and everything, um, you mentioned in your talk, uh, the mother garden on campus and then it expanding uh, to some other locations as well. And so one of the questions is um, how difficult would it be to expand or take the medicine wheel garden to other uh, either educational institutions or other sacred sites? Um, and how would they go about doing that? Well, you heard how I did it, and I would not recommend that path right there. I mean, learn from me. If you don't know nothing about nothing, find somebody who knows something about something. But the truth of the matter is, even with the lack of experience and the lack of knowledge that I had, we did it. Because, because a university campus has so many knowledgeable people on it. So, you know, I'm hitting up Mac Alford, you know, and Mike Davis and, you know, other people all you know, regularly when I don't know something and, and they've given tours in the garden as well. So university campus is the perfect place to bring a medicine wool garden because if that's what you want to do, because there's a lot of knowledgeable people there. So what I would do is find the space first and then you can plan for how much you're going to need to build the space um, there are grassroots organizations and lots of gardening organizations that support developing gardens, especially with native plants, especially right now, because it's a, the thing to do. Um, my gar the medicinal garden needs no water. I mean, I will bring a new plant in. If I bring a baby plant in or, a, you, know, a, you know, a toddler, <laughs> I'll bring it in, I'll plant it, I'll water it for about a week, and then I leave that plant alone. And I'm like, good luck to you, buddy and walk away <laughs> and you saw it busting out of the seams. I mean, most everything, especially if you bring it from nearby, the woods, the forest or something like that. I mean, it knows it's home. It's just home down the street. You know, it's like at the neighbor's house and, and, and the plant does perfectly fine. So I would say, get a space figure out the size of the space, um, start getting people involved because the thing that it does require, especially early, early on, and actually really throughout is a lot of tending. But I get students to help me do that. I teach, well, I shouldn't even say this, but I will. I teach statistics and, you know, they will do anything literally. And, but Fisher, the guy who developed like the ANOVA and all of these like really commonly used statistics, he was an agricultural person. So we get out there and I'll have them planting, you know, different rows and we'll do different things to them and do just what Fisher did when he developed ANOVA. So, so yeah, you can pretty much get anybody involved in a garden is what I'm saying. Very good. So I have a personal question, and that is, uh, what is your favorite traditional meal? And uh, if you have any insights uh, to share about how it's prepared, I'd love to hear that too. I like banaha. Have you ever had that? I've not. I've had similar dishes, but not banaha. 
So I take blue corn, blue corn meal, because that's healthy for you. I take blue corn meal and you mix it with a little bit of water and you make like a paste out of it. And I cook like black eyed peas because I like black eyed peas with like onions and some seasoning in them. And sometimes maybe a little bit of chicken or something. Anyway, you make a little paste out of the bana out of the blue corn, um, like a little kind of like a, a patty maybe. And then I put that um, black eyed peas on top of that. Uh, you have to boil or at least soften some um, corn husks and you slap that into a corn husk, um, kind of fold it over, tie it, take one corn husk and rip it into like little shoestrings. You tie it with that and drop it in some boiling water. And it's sort of um, some, it sort of gets um, kind of like a tamale really, but not with the, all that meat in there but kind of like a tamale consistency. But I like the blue corn because it has a good consistency or I find it does and I know it's healthy. So I like that. Now on that blue corn, uh, are you grinding that uh, and making that cornmeal yourself or is it available commercially? The one, oh yeah, it's available commercially, but you can grind it and make it yourself too. Um, I act. It's available commercially. It's all over okay. the place. Okay. <laughs> That's good. the easy way. <laughs> good. Well, very good. Well, I want to come to come to your house for dinner as soon as COVID's over. You can do it. Mm -hmm. You can do it. Very good. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. So uh, I want to say thank you for uh, being a part of the Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration. And I'm going to hand it over to Emily to wrap us up. Yes, I just want to say thank you as well. Um, I know I feel inspired. I kind of want to go get my hands dirty now. <laughs> so that was great. Thank you so much, Tammy. Um, thank you again, Lance, for helping us out today. And um, if you have any more questions and we didn't get to them, you can let me know and I'll facilitate that with Tammy or if you're interested in helping out. <laughs> um, if you would, please uh, don't forget that we do have surveys circulating. And don't forget that uh, we have another presentation coming up this afternoon and then continuing through Saturday. And I thank you for joining us and hope you will be back. All right. Thank you.